This is my first time in Ireland. And I have to say that if I knew there were so many fans of the papal posse and the Catholic thing, I would have come much earlier than, <laughs> than this trip. I want to thank Anthony uh, and commend the, the Lumen Fidei Institute. I founded, as he said, the, the Faith and Reason Institute in 1998, shortly after John Paul II published the encyclical Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, because I thought that that should be the inspiration of something in Washington. And as I looked around Washington, I'd been working in think tanks since the early 1980s in Washington. I, I calculated that there was not an, access, an, an excess of either faith or reason in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and that they were both growth industries and I would never go out of business. <laughs> and that's proved to, proven to be the case. And I hope it's the case also for Lumen Fidei, which takes its name, of course, from the great encyclical of our Pope Emeritus. Benedict the 16th. Well, I want to say that in a way I regret being here. I regret, I think all of us should regret that we have to be here and we do have to be here because of many of the things that are transpiring in our beloved church. And just to pick one element that I saw in the Irish Times yesterday, so it can't be fake news, it must be true. <laughs> I saw that an Irish archbishop, who I've known for years, we used to be on panels together in Rome, said the following, I'm gonna read this because I don't wanna be accused of misquoting. There are some who would like the world meeting, who would look at the world meeting as some sort of ideological rally, not this meeting, but the one across the street. There are some who would look at the world meeting as some sort of ideological rally. Oh, I'm sorry. To, uh, to look at some sort of ide ideological uh, rally to celebrate a type of family that probably does not exist. Now, I have to say, after years of dealing with conflicts, controversies, oppositions in religious and, and public life, this has got to be one of the most puzzling statements I've ever seen in my life. I, can an Irish archbishop actually think that a normal family, which is to say a husband and a wife, married in church, probably with children and, and other family, that that is a type of family that probably doesn't exist? I, I have a feeling that's what he means. And I think you probably all know there are plenty of families like that in, in, um, in Ireland. So it's, it's regrettable that we have to respond to people like this in our own church. I'm not going to mention the name of who it is. You can probably easy enough figure it out. But it's a strange time to be a Catholic. In all the ups and downs that there have been in, in the Catholic Church over 2,000 years, certain things have remained steady. And, and I would say even beyond question in the church, notably on basic human realities like marriage and family. So that we must now defend them even within our own church is regrettable, but it also tells us a great deal. Now, I've been asked coming at the close of this wonderful event, and I've learned a great deal and I've been inspired a great deal by the things that I've heard here, including from you in the audience, that I, I speak in broad terms about the current divisions, I'm gonna to get to America a little bit, of course, and also the challenges and the opportunities that these divisions present. Now, I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to repeat uh, what you've already heard in these sessions. I tried to craft this in a way that, it, I'll put it this way, I'm gonna take everything that's been set up till now for granted. So we'll, we'll take that and we'll, we'll use it going uh, forward. And I fully endorse a lot of what we've, we've heard. I thought it might be useful for me coming from America, to take a kind of a longer perspective of what's likely now to be the struggle for us in the church. Because given the, the problems we face, this is not only going to take a great deal of energy and imagination, it's gonna take a lot of what you might call holy patience. It's gonna be a long struggle, and we shouldn't kid ourselves about this. Um, what I'd like to say is 
This may seem a little artificial. There are two types of struggles now that we have to engage in. One is sort of direct confrontation, as we just saw with Professor Ureta. And I don't know about you, but I've actually had spent some time in Latin America, and I was unaware of a fair bit of what he presented. So we ourselves have to communicate our, among ourselves when we have victories like that, and we must be prepared for what I, I kind of call mechanical engagement of a problem. Now, those are the kinds of things that you can solve in the short run. You confront a problem like religious liberty, like abortion, and those problems are, are sometimes winnable. And I want to talk about later in, in my paper about some of the positive signs coming forward in the United States, uh, especially on religious liberty questions, I think. But there's a whole other group of problems that we are going to have to attack, and they don't admit of immediate technical solutions. I was very taken the other day in that video that John uh, Lacken, is, is it right, John Lacken put together with that young blonde woman who says, Ireland hasn't, has come so far in the last 10 years, she doesn't live, listen so much anymore to the church. I remember seeing pictures of young Irish men and women after the abortion vote was taken and saying to myself, we have kids exactly like that in the United States, and they know not what they do. They don't listen to the church, but who do they listen to? They listen to some culture that has told them that sex between any two people, as long as it's consensual, is OK. They've listened to a culture that tells them that killing babies in the womb is liberation and freedom. And they celebrate this in public. They're not bad kids. They've been evangelized by a culture that we should be evangelizing. Instead, that, that culture has evangelized the church. And we have to push back at this in a variety of very clever and perhaps even subtle ways. Because we have to rebuild the kind of trust with young people like that, with people who are probably her parents' age and maybe even her grandparents' age, with one another, trust within the hierarchy of the church that many of us feel is wobbly right now, trust between God and man, trust between man and nature, a whole variety of, of cultural and communal uh, reconstructions that are going to take a lot of, pre a, a lot of uh, holy patience on our part. But I say to you, it's a great time to be a Catholic. It's a great time to have this challenge put to us. And we have to recognize that God chose us to be alive at this moment. And unless you have some warped Catholic idea that God brought you onto the earth at this moment to be punished with all this nonsense going on in the church and the world, he's chosen each one of us to be here today and to be present at this moment in history because he has confidence that we can respond to the challenges. And let's pray that we're up to that challenge. So what I'd like to do just in, in large terms is I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down into three large categories. First, I'd like to talk about what world are we existing in right now? Because we need to know, the, we, we need to know very candidly and without flinching at, at the problems, what is the world that we exist in? Second, I'd like to talk about what is the church that we exist in right now? And if this doesn't give Anthony a heart attack, I'm actually gonna name some names, not Irish names. Though. This is what the posse does, so I might as well do it anyway when I'm, I'm here in Ireland. And then third, I want to talk about what are some of the opportunities, difficulties, um, some things that we might look to going forward. So let me start with what world are we in? I think the easiest way to describe, well, many people have touched on it in a different way over the last two days. The easiest way to describe the world that we exist in right now is that it is a world that is post-truth. Now, this is not a term that has been developed by highly orthodox Catholic intellectuals. This is a term that's actually used, I don't know if it is used in Ireland, but it's used a great deal in the United States these days, sometimes to refer to the way that social media 
and, and media spin have, have replaced what is sort of normal reporting would have been in the past. But to think of the world as post-truth gives us a sense of a wide variety of things where principles have kind of disappeared and what we have instead is human, radical human choice. And this leads, I think, very clearly to two very stark oppositions in society. We know, we've talked about it in terms of our Catholic faith, but there's, there's even, I think, a deeper way to think about this that, in, that takes in a larger class of people. The two versions are basically this. Um, let, me, let me start by saying, saying this th this way. If you had to look at what is the thing most in dispute about the Catholic tradition, it's the very first page of Genesis. In his own image and likeness, he made them. Male and female, he made them. All right? If it can be said that the church, or in the, this case, Moses or the, the Jews, the, if that whole tradition that stretches back four or 5,000 years, if it got that wrong on the very first page, what didn't it get wrong, right? Because that is a, a statement about what human beings are, what God created human beings to be, what relations between men and women and, and what families ought to be. And that stretches back. This is not a production, I often like to say, of a bunch of Italian monsignori with too much time on their hands in Rome between, between pasta. Uh, this goes back to the very foundations of Judaism as well as, as, as uh, Christianity. So when we defend that, we're not defending some, some, some theory of sexual morality. We're defending the very revelation on which Western religion has been based from the very beginning. And so when there are disputes about that, to, at that level, what arise are two very different views of the human person. And I'm going to put this a little bit simplistically, but I'm sure you can recognize this. On the one hand, there's a view of the human person that's a bit biblically based view. It has some elements, as we heard from some other speakers, with the best pagan thought as well. There's, there's a, a, a view of God the creator, who created a world with a certain order, who placed human beings into that world with a certain understanding of what would be good for them, and in the case of Judaism and Christianity, revealed for our own sake what it is that we need to do in order to be happy in this world and to live in uh, eternal beatitude in the next world. Now, it's not difficult to figure out what the opposite point of view is. The opposite point of view is that if there is a creator, I often think in this context there's an old joke about American Unitarians. Unitarians are, are, are a people who believe that there is at most one God. <laughs> think about that for a minute. <laughs> The opposite view is it, there may be a creator, but he doesn't really interest himself in what we do all that much. Probably there isn't. Um, there is no plan for the universe. The world is sort of random energy and, and matter. There is no plan for human life, certainly not for, for men and women. And so, you know, we can, we can make up what we want. I regret to say that an Irish American Supreme Court justice once expressed this view uh, in, a, in a decision about abortion. He said, this is, his name, name is Anthony Kennedy, by the way. He just retired in June. He said, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. In other words, you make it all up yourself. Now, in the confused way of public discourse um, and the swamp of digital media, they, these two views don't exactly oppose one another clearly. You know, they're, they're kind of all, all mixed up in, in public. But let's be clear about this, at least. Compared to what we usually think of as public life, which is the conflict between conservatives and liberals, you know, that's been the traditional political conflict for decades in the West, 
that's, that, all that is kid stuff compared to this profound difference about human nature and human origins. Because this goes to the very root of everything. Liberals and conservatives can actually agree about a, a number of things. And the, the church used to be a steadying influence in, in our politics in the sense that it steadied society when the society needed steadying and it was prophetic when the society needed prophecy. But right now, um, because the church itself has become unsteady and has begun to absorb this, this ambiguity or uncertainty about what is the nature of human persons, the church itself is part of um, this difficulty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, in public, the way this plays out, it, there's a certain asymmetry, as we say in the United States, in how this plays out in public. Because look, on the one hand, as we just heard from our now retired Supreme Court Justice, you make it all up. Any person can make up his own meaning of the universe. On the other hand, as we all know to our sorrow, it's a great and horrible, hate-filled thing for you to have a different view than that view of making it all up. That, that to have the view that a person can just decide what they want to do with their own bodies. Now, in a, in a post-truth world, if everybody had, had, had agreed about that, then certainly we should be allowed to have our own points of view as Catholics. But the asymmetry that I'm talking about is that, in fact, there's a double standard which really conceals a single standard. That, that seemingly neutral, radical idea of people making up their own lives and making up their own morality is in itself seeking to impose itself everywhere. As we know, in the United States, as I'm sure you're, you're quite well, well aware of here in Ireland as, as, uh, as well. And that's why I think we see in Latin America, in my own country, that people who are defending traditional beliefs about human beings, sometimes they're even secularists or they're very weak religious believers who just kind of think it's sanity, unlike the, the Irish archbishop, it's just sanity to say that a normal family is kind of the type of thing that, that exists. And so we hear that for those of us who actually have a strong view of what human beings are and what nature is and what God is, we're the Ku Klux Klan, we're the Taliban. You know, we're not just a, a, a Christian body that happens to have a, a certain view of human beings in the world. We're, we're a threat. And we must recognize that that is how we are viewed by a, a large number of people throughout the world these days. So, let me go on to my second point. That, that's the large picture of what, what is the world that we exist in right now. Let me go on to my second point. Where is the church in all of this? What, what is the church like at this point? Now, I'm gonna be quite blunt about a couple of these things. And I'm sure that you, you've all seen this yourselves so you won't be shocked by it. Since the election of Pope Francis, I think the church has greatly diminished its essential countercultural role. And so what we see is that, unfortunately, met, a, a certain metaphysics, a certain um, moral theology, a certain ontology, these things are clashing in politics, where they, do, they should not clash. Politics is not a place where there's a lot of thought. P politicians are generally not philosophers. The place where, where those, those profound ideas of the world should be debated is in a different level. But instead, because the church itself has kind of lost its, its grip on, um, on what I would call the, the culture war, we see those things being enacted out as, a, uh, as public policies. Now, the, the image that Pope Francis has put forward since the beginning of his pontificate, and in some ways it's a good one, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, is the idea of the church as a field hospital, which was a strange notion when he first began to propose propose it, but it has a, a certain logic, but a certain limit as well. The logic is this, that the world is a fallen place. And so it, it is, there is a battle going on, not only an earthly battle, but as St. Paul tells us, we're battling with principalities and powers. And one of the two things that the church must do is to be av available to help people who are, who, who have been wounded in this spiritual and and uh, earthly battle that's going on simultaneously. But 
I would add, a field hospital is not enough. That's just for the, the temporary treatment of emergency cases. And I would even go farther than this. Um, a doctor who is someone who accompanies you through an illness, who holds your hand and soothes you when you're in distress. That's a doctor that we may say has a good bedside manner. I don't know if he used that term in Ireland or not. But if he doesn't know medicine, <laughs> or he doesn't want to apply it, he can't really cure you. He can make you. Maybe he can even make you feel good, but he can't cure you. Now, in this context, I'm going to mention another person by name. And, and this is some, these, these are some unfortunate remarks that another Irish-American kind of person, Cardinal Kevin Farrell, made um, a little while ago. He's, lived, he's a native-born Irish, but he lived in the United States for a long time. He's now obviously the head of the uh, Dicastery for Lady, Family, and Life, and is the organizer of the other co uh, conference on families this week. You may recall that he said about priests preparing people for marriage. They have no, I'm quoting now, they have no credibility. They have never lived the experience. They may know moral theology, dogmatic theology in theory, but to go from there into practice every day they don't have the experience. Now, there's a sense, of course, in which this is true, because priests, most priests have never been married. But for me, this is like pitting medical knowledge against having a good bedside manner, right? If moral theology and theology have nothing to say to people who are about to get married, what use are they, right? I mean, why do we study these things? Do they have any practical benefit to us? Do they help us get to heaven? Do they help us you know, live through our, our daily lives? Clearly, those subjects must come into any discussion of what family and marriage is, even if a priest doesn't know necessarily what it's like to get up in the morning and who's going to make the bed and who's going to make the coffee. That, that is all sorts of the kind of thing that, we, that are, can be worked out on a, on a theoretical, on a practical level. I covered the election of Pope Francis for EWTN with Father Murray, Father Roger Landry, and Raymond Arroyo, and I've always been um, impressed by that charisma that he has, the way he has, he's able to, to really reach out and, and touch people. Um, but I have to say in all candor and in sheer devotion to the truth that I think he's largely played into the, this view of theology and careful Catholic thought that it's in some cases almost an obstacle to being present to people. That, that instead of, of in, empowering us and explaining to us how we can help people, that it is some sort of obstacle. Father Anthony Spadaro, SJ, who's the, the uh, editor-in-chief of La Civita Cattolica, has said about the Holy Father that he doesn't try to think out the implications of decisions that he makes you know, across a wide spectrum of issues. What he does is he looks at them in some sort of Jesuit reflection uh, and insight and then makes a decision about that and just lets the rest of it come out where it comes out. I think that's why sometimes we have a feeling that he's, he's self-contradictory, that he says something at one moment that seems to contradict something in another moment because he is such a charismatic man and he wants to be able to speak to people at a given moment, but the Pope of Rome has a certain position and has a great visibility. So when the Pope of Rome says, who am I to judge? The world takes that very seriously. My own, my own youngest daughter, um, who is, my older kids have come in for a landing. My, my youngest is still looking for the runway. Uh, in a way. <laughs> she came, and, and I think she's typical of her age. She came to, came home uh, a few weeks after the Pope made that remark, and she said, hey, Dad, did you hear the Pope said being gay is okay? He didn't actually say that. But that's, if you're not careful in a certain role, what you say, that's the kind of message that's heard despite what you actually said. Now, I, I think that this 
this seems to this, this idea of rigid ideas and rigid theologies must correspond to something in the Pope's life, something in his, his experience, because he, he speaks about this so often, and it's become almost a leitmotif of his papacy, that people who know Argentina better than I do may be able to trace this back to why that is a, 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 a sort of dedicated position of, of his. But I've got to say that that to take that, that view doesn't correspond to my own experience. It may ex correspond to some experience that he's had. Let me just quote for you from, for you from um, this was what he said at the Chrism Mass on Holy Thursday this year. We must be careful not to fall into the temptation of making idols of certain abstract truths. They can be comfortable idols, always within easy reach, they offer a certain prestige and power and are difficult to discern because the truth idol imitates, it dresses itself up in the words of the gospel, but does not let those words touch the heart. Much worse, it distances ordinary people from the healing closeness of the word and the sacraments of Jesus. Now, we all know that there's a certain type of person who, is, who, who fails at this, that, that, that understands theology abstractly and doesn't engage people. But I go back to my beginning. And I say that we live in a post-truth age. And in my own country, and in the, the other countries that I visit regularly, you know, almost yearly, if you ask me in my experience, is rigidity and making an idol of truth the main problem that the church is engaged with, I would have to say no. For our time, truth is something that seems so distant that it seems as if it almost doesn't exist at all. So I don't know ex exactly how to make these two things to, go th to come together, but it's quite clear to me that there's, a, there's another problem that has to be dealt with uh, within the church, and it's not by accident, by the way. It doesn't explain everything, but it's not by accident that the large bump in priestly abuse that we had in the United States. I don't know the Irish situation very well, but the large bump occurred in the 1960s and the 1970s when the church's own confidence in her truth began to wobble. I, th I think that accounts for not all, but a good portion of the problem that we saw. So this brings me to my final large category. You know, what, what does all this mean for us in the terms of the roles we must lead as Christians? Now, the first thing I would say is there are many mansions in this house, so not all of us need to do the papal posse, thank God. Uh, not all of us need to be engaged in, in public debates about Catholicism. But in a post-truth age, the church, which is the longest standing truth-seeking and truth-teaching institution in the world, let me say that again, truth-seeking and truth teaching institution in the world, the church must play a very strong role in affirming that there are truths, that we can know them. God wants us to know these truths, and they matter for our earthly life, and they matter for eternal life. Now, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Professor Ureta about Rod Dreher's book, um, The Benedict Option, just a little bit, because I think there are limits uh, it's for that book uh, as well. Plato says in a number of places that there are times when the public order becomes so bad that a philosopher or someone seeking the truth has to withdraw. And I think in part what he has in mind, you all know the story of Socrates being a truth teller and being given the hemlock for, for, be, for being a truth teller. Aristotle says the same thing. Aristotle, who usually people think of as the responsible philosopher, the guy who engages public affairs. When Athens went bad, he said he, he had to return to Macedonia for a while, lest Athens sin twice against philosophy. He was worried about his own life. And there's nothing wrong with, with Rod Dreher's proposal that we may, at times as Catholics, need to adopt a kind of defensive posture. That's not the only posture we need to adopt because it is, not the, it is not the nature of the Catholic Church to be a sect. 
It is the nature of the Catholic Church to be a church, which means a, you know, a body that engages all of human life, seeks to, to inform the public order, and in fact to convert the entire world. But it is true, and I think Rod has something very important to say to us, because we must face directly the fact that if we judge solely by human terms right now, we Catholics are going to be entering a dark age. Not a dark age like the old one in which the Roman economy collapsed and in, in which a, a public order uh, disappeared. I think probably a dark age in which the gadgets will continue to work for, at least for a while. Uh, there'll be kind of public order, you know, traffic will still wrong, ride on the wrong side of the road here in Ireland. Um, maybe the lights will stay on for a while, you know. But we may face that. You know, we may face a period in which uh, our public life has become so hostile to Christianity that, it, that we're in something like either the catacombs or a dark age. And don't, don't dismiss this. This is entirely possible. You know, we, 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 uh, we would like to think that we can succeed, and we, we have, as we've, we've seen in, in a number of the presentations, we would like to think that we can succeed against these discrete questions, and we may, but our culture is in deep trouble. And it didn't just turn into deep trouble at Vatican II, it's been in deep trouble now for several hundred years, and it's gonna take that holy patience that I talked about earlier for us to, uh, to reverse it. Now, the, the better part of Rod Dreher's book, and, and Rod's a, a good guy, is the analysis, which is the threat to th the churches everywhere. Not only the Catholic Church, but e evangelicals, all the people who believe in that traditional view of human existence. The weakness is, well, you know, what are the, what are the remedies? Because the, the current, the, the modern nation state will not leave you alone. And it particularly will not leave you alone on questions like homosexuality. Um, I was very struck by John Lacken's remark the, the, in the, uh, one of the early sessions yesterday that in the year 2000, I hadn't thought about this, the year 2000, no nation had gay marriage, and here we are in 2018, and it's assumed that any nation that doesn't have gay marriage is backward and, and somehow evil, homophobic. It's an enormous cultural change, and, and it's something that we have to respond to. Now, there are, I think, in the public realm, some encouraging signs. And one of them that I think exists in both America and in Europe is what some people have begun to call populism. Now this is a, a vague reaction, I think, on the, many, on the part of many people who think that the international elites certainly no longer represent the people in most nations. It's true in the United States, it was, it was true before the election of Donald Trump, but it's, I think it's even more evident now. We heard from our speaker from Hungary. I, I've been in Hungary recently, and I, I find it very impressive. I, I run a program in the Slovak Republic every year, and those Visegrad countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Czech Republic even, Slovakia, even Austria a little bit now, we've got a coalition government in Italy that is a, a kind of a populist government. Brexit in England is in a way, I think, part of the same resistance to, you know, to the international elite. Something's stirring here. Something is stirring at a public level, not necessarily a Catholic level, but a public level. The British philosopher Roger Scruton says that the elites dismiss as populism whenever the people vote or do something that the elites don't like. I think it's a brilliant way to formulate it, right? Because they seem to think that we all ought to just either be quiet and go along or be convinced by what they're putting forward on an international level. And it isn't working. Because there, there truly is a serious resistance in many countries. And, and all of you here, I think, are, are part of that as well. <clears throat> to just point to one very hopeful sign in my own country, the Irish-American Anthony, Anthony Kennedy has retired, as I mentioned earlier, who came up with that mystery passage of our, our defining our own meaning of the universe. And he, uh, President Trump, has nominated another Irish-American Catholic, 
I don't know how Catholic Kennedy was, but he was, he did call himself a Catholic. President Trump has nominated another Irish American Catholic named Brett Kavanaugh to replace Kennedy. Now, Kavanaugh is probably not the kind of ideological judge that some people would like, but he's the kind of judge that I like. He believes in the rule of law. He actually believes that the American Constitution is what ought to govern the people. And while I very much would like to see a Catholic, a, a Christian, and even Catholic ethos injected into many areas in, in America, I'm worried about the, the, the government taking this on, at least in my country. Because I think of that old line in A Man for All Seasons, where Son Roper tells Thomas More that he'd, he'd like to cut down the laws of England because they're standing in his way. And, and Moore says, and Son Roper, when, the, when all the trees are down, and would you be able to stand in the winds that would then blow? Civilization requires us to have institutions that are going to proceed by an orderly uh, method. And that means within the church as well as in the secular world as a whole. So I think that this is a great um, a strange sign that a populist who has no experience in po politics is now appointed a second Supreme Court judge, which means we have a, a majority of five in America, and maybe there will even be a sixth. So God uses strange instruments even in the United States. So what about the church? Let's talk about the church for a while. At least for an American, it's hard for us now to talk about church renewal, given that the background of everything at the present moment has to do with the abuse crisis. If it were up to me, I really wish we could, as we were mostly able to before the McCarrick revelations, talk more vigorously about a better balance between the dogmatic and the pastoral in the church. This is the main controversy that Pope Francis has brought to the surface, right? I mean, he, he and many of his supporters keep saying that there is no dogmatic change an awful lot of people who I respect as theologians, philosophers, church historians, beg to differ. And an awful lot of people in the world, and, and you may notice that a lot of secularists like what they see here, which may tell us something that we Catholics from inside the church may not necessarily see ourselves. But I wish we could be focusing at this moment on that better balance between the truth element in the church and the pastoral element. Instead, I think what we're going to be obsessed with, at least in the United States for some time, is the abuse crisis. But it's not the abuse crisis that you keep hearing about. It's not, yet again, priests who abused children, prepubescent boys, other priests, etc. That was the problem in the early 2000s, which the church in the United States has largely resolved. It hasn't resolved all the legal cases and whatnot. But we often say in the United States that one of the safest places for a child or a young adult to be these days is, is in the Catholic Church, because we have reporting uh, procedures that are very effective. You can't root out human sin. There are going to be sinful priests, sinful bishops. But we do pretty well with that. I said a couple of weeks ago in a column at the Catholic thing that the bishops in the United States had not recognized that we had passed an, what I call an inflection point, meaning that there was no going back, that because of the revelations of Cardinal, about Cardinal ex-Cardinal McCarrick, another Irish American, unfortunately, that it was going to be impossible for our bishops to ignore misdeeds by other bishops. Now, I want to tell you an interesting thing. In the 1980s, I was starting out in my career, and I was the editor-in-chief of a magazine in Princeton, New Jersey, and I already knew about McCarrick. That's almost 40 years ago. And I was, I was a young pup. I was a, you know, a nobody running a little magazine in Princeton. And priests in New Jersey who I would talk with who were friends off the record would tell me about the beach house. I'm sure you've heard about the beach house that McCarrick used to take people to. So this is, whatever people tell you that they, whenever people tell you they didn't hear about this, they didn't know anything about it, it's nonsense. Everybody knew about it. 
I'm sorry? Well, here, this is the question I would like to now put in front of you. This gentleman just commented, why was nothing done? And I think the inflection point that I mentioned that has passed is that the bishops cannot any longer fail to speak publicly and to act on such issues. Now, what I mean by that is this. Leadership will have to come to Ro from Rome at some point. But my wife and I, my wife is here, and we talk about this all the time at home. And we both realized a few weeks ago, a few bishops started to step forward. And they would say, this is it. We can no longer enjoy the trust of our people unless we bishops hold one another accountable. I remember one morning we said to, to, to each other, there were three or four bishops had come forward and said that. This is what every bishop who does not want to remain under suspicion is now going to have to do. Because the presumption at this point, sadly, the presumption is that if you do not come out and make a very forceful public statement about not just the penitence and shame and, you know, that's all true. If you do not come out and say, we're going to do something to hold ourselves accountable, then I don't think you as a bishop are going to retain much trust of your, your flock. Back when I, I wrote about this, our bishops were talking about, yes, we'll deal with this at our annual November meeting in Baltimore. I said, November meeting? It's early August. You, yes, people are on vacation, but people notice that the bishops of the United States are going to wait three or four months after there's just been a revelation about a horrifying series of uh, immorality and outright crimes committed by a prince of the church who was very highly respected in Rome, was giving all sorts of missions to carry out for the Vatican, and everyone knew. Everyone knew. So I think that what's going to happen at this point is painful, but it's good. It's going to be a cleansing fire. There are already rumors, I don't know if these are true or not, but I'm hearing that the Holy Father has asked Archbishop Shikluna from Malta, who investigated the situation in Chile, has it asked him also to come to the United States. It's going to be a much bigger job in America. Chile is a wonderful country. I've visited there, but it's, it's tiny compared to the United States. We have, we have dioceses that have larger populations archdiocese that have larger populations than Chile. And there are many cases, many cases going back many years that are going to have to be investigated. If true, if true, that's quite important. And I'll predict, you can write me and tell me I, I was wrong, but I'll predict that you will see other major cases, not in, the, in coming years, but in coming weeks and months in the United States and perhaps elsewhere. Because let's not forget that this same failure by hierarchy has also taken place in Chile, in um, Honduras, and that it has roots that go all the way into the Vatican. It's simply going to be impossible in the United States to avoid scrutiny because our secular investigators, our criminal investigators, are going to be looking into these cases everywhere. There, there's a Pennsylvania DA's report that I'm sure many of you heard about came out a, a week or so ago. That's going to happen, if not in every state in the United States, in a lot of them. So that momentum is just going to be ir irresistible going forward. The main question for me, and, and something I think we Catholics are going to have to encourage the Holy See to do, is to recognize why was nothing done on McCarrick? Did the Diocese of Metuchen, which is a small diocese in New, in New Jersey, and the diocese, the, the diocese of Newark, which is close to New York City, both paid out settlements about Cardinal McCarrick and knew what he had done. Did they not report this to the, the papal nuncio in Washington? Did the, did the nuncio did not, not report this to the Congregation for Bishops? Did no one in the Congregation for Bishops think that this was important enough to stop a person from becoming Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., the imperial city of our time, the city that I, that I, I live in right now. This is a, these are going to be painful times, but it is necessary because it's going to be a cleansing fire. 
And we must also not be deluded that this is not a homosexual problem. Right? Homosexuals are a small percentage of the population in the world, everywhere in the world. Okay? It, it, there's some talk that it's, there's a high level of homosexuals in the American priesthood because of periods when they, they, they came into the priesthood in the 60s and 70s. That may be true. But nonetheless, it certainly isn't 50%. It's probably in the teens. And yet, 80 over 80% of the abuse cases in the United States were of prepubescent boys, homosexual acts, not pedophilia, homosexual acts. So whatever Father Martin says about differently ordered, which I, I think is part of that second view of the human person, that you know, God doesn't have a, have a sexual order. It's differently ordered. And maybe transgenders have a different order. And who knows, you know, Patriarchal families with four wives and many children are is differently ordered. But this is going to be something that will be good for the church, not in the short run, but it'll be good in the long run. But we Catholics, because the reach of the American criminal investigation will not go into Rome, we must make sure that everyone in Rome who might have been involved knows that the rest of the world is looking we're looking to see that there is responsibility in a concrete sense in our church at the very highest levels. In other words, that we don't just talk about, yes, we're all going to manifest solidarity. We're going to talk about structures that are going to hold bishops, archbishops, and even cardinals responsible. I don't know what form that's going to take. This could be a long-term project, but it has to be done if we're not going to um, miss the opportunity of cleansing the church that exists right at this moment. M much of what the church does in the future is going to depend on the, the world allowing the church to be the church, people within the church allowing the church to be a church. I'm a little bit pessimistic about this because I think we're seeing religious speech and practice um, limited in North America and Europe. Uh, somebody said, one of the sisters said to me last night at dinner that um, as long as she's able to wear her habit, she's happy in the world. And that if Hillary Clinton had been elected, she probably might not be allowed to wear that habit. It's a sobering thought. It's a very sobering thought. The church is going to have to push back very forcefully everywhere. It, the, the bishops may think that they can make a halfway um, compromise with the world, but they can't. As several speakers have talked about, that world is relentless. And if you don't believe and believe enough to put yourself on the line, even to the point of martyrdom, you will not survive what, in what's going to happen. I want to quote for you a remark by Rizgar Legutko, who was the editor of the newspaper Solidarity during the great period when the Polish labor union overthrew communism. And let's take, let's take heart from this, because no one knew. I, I, was a, I was a Fulbright student studying in Italy in 1978 when John Paul II was elected. No one knew in 1978 or even 1988 that communism was finished. But it was. And it just took combined efforts by Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Pope John Paul II, and many others, like Valenza, and people like Riscard Legutko, to push back with the truth to overthrow even a murderous regime like the Soviet Union. But here's what Legutko has to say about us now. I'm quoting. He's talking about the Poles joining our Western civilization after the fall of communism. The picture the Poles had of this civilization was from before all these changes that have liberalized Europe. When Christianity was relatively strong and classical, metaphysics and epistemology were still very much on, not only in the air, but in the educational curricula. This picture presupposed a continuity, not easy to describe, but taken for granted between antiquity and Christianity on the one hand and modern times on the other. This is what Poles thought about the West before they were free. 
nobility of soul, moral virtue, sainthood, and salvation were seen as continuous with ideas of mobility, liberty, and democratic republicanism. Even the Enlightenment and Romanticism were included as a dissenting voice within a civilization that remained classical and Christian. For Eastern Europeans, it was unimaginable, they soon learned, it was unimaginable that Western civilization could dissociate from all this as if from some burdensome impedimenta, just like communism did to the despair of those who lived under it. I find this utterly shocking that an intelligent person who fought the good fight when it mattered looks at our culture in the West and says that we're, if not in, in full reality, at least in large appearance, looking to be repressive in the same way as the old Marxists. So let me conclude. It may be an odd reflection, but it's certainly not something to be proud of, but I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. All time is God's time. God chose us to exist at this time. It's a moment of profound division in society, profound division in the church herself, and yet at the same time, a chance for great opportunities to cleanse the church, to make clear a different way of life that people all over the world sense is missing in our culture. And it's up to us as Catholics to make that a reality, and it can be a reality if we seize it, just as the defeat of the former Soviet Union was. But to do this, we need to be certain types of people ourselves. Here's a powerful passage that comes from Joseph Ratzinger's Faith in the Future, our, our wonderful emeritus Pope Benedict XVI. The future of the church can and will issue from those whose roots are deep and who live from the, full, from the pure fullness of their faith. It will not issue from those who accommodate themselves merely to the passing moment, or from those who merely criticize others and assume that they themselves are infallible measuring rods. Nor will it issue from those who take the easier road, who sidestep the passion of faith. The future of the church, once again as always, will be shaped by saints, by men, that is, whose minds probe deeper than the slogans of the day, who see more than others see because their lives embrace a wider reality. Now this is both a daunting and an inspiring vision. It's bracing because it's daunting. I say again, it's a great time to be a Christian because there's much for a Christian to do at this moment. This passage, I think, is eye-opening because of its inspiration and quite prophetic. It won't be easy. I myself wake up many days. You may see a smiling face on EWTN the world over, but I wake up many days wondering what I'm supposed to do that day because much is at stake. Many days I feel that the entire culture of the West and the church herself is at stake. But we can all be confident. We can be confident about the role that we are being asked to play because God has matched us with this hour. So let us pray that we're all worthy of his confidence. Thank you.